recording the session. Okay. Um, all right. Now, for ev everyone who's here, first of all, welcome. And thanks so much for coming um, to attend this session. You may be wondering where George is. <laughs> he is actually stuck on a motorway somewhere, um, having worked uh, in a different place this morning and um, having difficulty getting back. I know that George actually wanted to talk to you at the beginning of this session, so um, maybe we'll postpone that until the end of the session. Um, I'm just wondering if I should I'll just put my video on for a minute. Um, well, has it come through? Yeah, <laughs> just to say hello and then I'll um, switch it off again. Or maybe I should just leave it like that. I don't know if you prefer um, video or not. Um, a little bit about me. It's, as it says there, I'm an independent education consultant, um, work with lots of um, different universities, and uh, currently a lot of my work is in research, and particularly into research in um, open learning environments. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from. My background is in teaching in schools and in teacher training. Um, so I'm bringing all of that past experience uh, into this presentation, and, or, or as much as I can fit into the presentation, and um, it's very definitely a personal perspective on open academic practice. Uh, I know from looking down the list of people who are here that um, there are many people here who uh, practice openly and will maybe have different perspective to me or can add things. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this being a collaborative um, effort, if you like. The other thing that I'd like to say at this time is that um, I don't, although I've got lots of pictures and things in my presentation, I don't put everything that I'm saying in my presentation. So um, I will be referring to things that are not in the presentation. Do ask if you want further information. Um, I do have some links that I could post in, or other people could find the links and post them in as we go along. So that's, that's my starting point. So here is on my first slide a um, picture, a slide, a photo that I took last year when I was uh, walking across northern England. There's a walk across northern England that goes from coast to coast. And um, this is in the northeast uh, when we were nearly at the end of the walk. Um, and I thought it was very typical of an open landscape. And basically, that's what's happening to us at the moment. We are moving more and more to working in open landscapes, learning landscapes, um, in which we need to work openly if we're going to take full advantage. But it's not that straightforward necessarily um, and can and does need quite a lot of thought about it. Ah, here is George. Hello, hello George. Um, I'll just carry on, George, and then I'll leave you some space at the end <laughs> to say some things, unless you want to take the mic right now and say hello. It's probably not quite ready yet. OK, so um, our learning landscapes are changing a lot at the moment. Uh, George, George posted a paper by, who was it by? Uh, Barbara Donnelly, um, it called um, An Avalanche is Coming, Higher Education and the Revolution Ahead. And it's a long paper, but I would recommend that you have a look at it, because it really does describe how our learning landscapes are changing. Professor Phil Levy, who is the uh, Deputy Chief Executive of the HEA has recently written that we can't ignore the changes that are happening at the moment and that now is a really timely moment for staff to think about to think about this. My own thinking about open learning landscapes really began with my interest in communities of practice and um, and the work of Etienne Wenger, which I know uh, who I know some of you are familiar with. Um, Marion's asked for a reference to that paper. Just a minute, I'll get that for you. Um, 
and put it in here. It's been, I can't remember which forum George posted it in. There it is. Um, and so Etienne talks about uh, learning in landscapes of practice. I mean, his main work is in community practice. And his thinking, very simply, is that um, we, we work in, we used to work in very small communities of practice. So for example, I live in a village. And in days gone by, um, I could have been a farmer's daughter. And my grandparents could have been farmers. And I would be expected to work on a farm. And I would maintain a very small, be working in a very small community um, with you know, all my relatives around. But those days don't exist anymore. We work in multiple communities of practice. Whether or not we're open, we are crossing communities all the time. And this, that's getting increasingly um, difficult to manage. So his work, Etienne Wenger's work on landscapes of practice, which you can find if you search online, um, is very interesting. And it's particularly interesting because he says, this work affects our identity and that the 21st century is um, the century of identity, which I think is very significant for how open we are going to be. The other people who are doing quite a lot of work about how the landscape is changing are John Drawn and um, Terry Anderson. Um, and they write about working in groups or in sets, or in networks, or in collectives. And I'm not going to go into detail about their work. Um, I will post a link for you. But it's worth having a look at what they say about that, because it does affect the way we work, who we work with, and how open we are. So all these um, things are affecting our, our work um, online. and generally in academic practice. Um, another interesting thing that Etienne Wenger has said is that we learn best at the boundaries of community of practice, or most at the boundaries of community of practice. And, I, and that sort of pushes you towards thinking, well, I can't just stay in my own community. I have to get out there and move into other communities. I have to network. Um, my own research. Uh, it's also looking into uh, what, those, what the characteristics of an open learning environment might be. And on my blog, I've got a publications page with a paper that's called Footprints of Emergence, which looks in detail at the different characteristics of open learning environments. So Professor Phil Levy has said we can't ignore current developments. So what is it that we can't ignore? He says we can't ignore the fact that we have open educational resources now, that we have um, massive open online courses, social media, mobile learning. And he wrote his, um, his note about this this year, 2013. But in fact, open practice has been around for a long time, since the 70s with the open source movement. And then in the 80s, we get uh, open journals, then open courseware in the 90s. Open educational resources has been around since 2001. Then we got YouTube in 2005, Facebook 2006, Twitter, which has really taken off 2007 with eBooks, and then the first MOOC or named as a MOOC Massive Open Online Course in 2008. Um, and then now we're into open data, um, 2011. So it's been going on a while. And, but now, um, with the explosion of MOOCs in particular that has happened in 2012, uh, we really can't um, ignore it any longer. So that set me off thinking. I started um, thinking about open practice in 2008 when I attended the first MOOC, um, the Connect of the CCK08, as, as it's known, MOOC. Um, and that really forced me to be open. So for example, I didn't have a blog before that. And it was requirement, a requirement of that MOOC to have a blog, or it was strongly recommended to have a blog. Um, and it was a scary moment, I remember. Uh, so 
since then, I've been thinking a lot about what are the characteristics of um, being open. Um, and for all of us, it, that means being an open academic. And two authors have written about this. Terry Anderson uh, has written about it in 2009. And there's a slide. Uh, I've got some references at the end of this presentation. So um, it's on there. There's a, a slide share where he goes in detail what, about the characteristics he would Put forward. And Martin Waller has published an ebook called The Digital Scholar where he talks about the characteristics of an open academic. So I thought, well, I'll just have a look and see um, how, how open am I <laughs> and how open do I want to be. And so I drew this um, radar chart by putting the characteristics around uh, on a, in a spreadsheet and um, then scoring myself from 1 to 10. I hope this makes sense. Um, so uh, the characteristics, if we start at the top at 12 o'clock, uh, distributed online identity all the way around clockwise to uh, create and share outputs are all the characteristics listed by Martin Weller. Terry Anderson lists most of those as well. Um, but in addition, he lists open research and uses and contrib contributes um, open educational resources. So this is what my profile looks like if I score myself from 1 to 10. And there are some things that I appear not to be very open about. I'd like, as I'm talking, for you to consider what where you might place yourself uh, on this grid and what, and what your, I would call this a sort of footprint, would look like. So Martin Weller recommends that you have a central place for your identity. And that is a very strong feature for me. Um, that's my blog. And he also um, recommends open publishing. Um, I think I try to do that as much as possible. If you look at my publications page, you'll see I think there's only two publications there that have not been published in open journals. Um, it's not that easy um, to always to publish in open journal, but I do try to do that now. Um, I, I'm not very good. You'll see I'm not that brilliant at networking. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's an ad given this is a talk about open academic practice, it's probably not a very good ad admission. Um, but I'm fairly selective and careful about who I network with. I'm not naturally a networker, and I'm not naturally very open. But I'm trying to be an open, open academic uh, through my open research. Um, I try and publish that as much as possible. Yes, and somebody has ringed that very low <laughs> score there, mixed personal and professional outputs. That is what Martin Weller has said is a characteristic of an open ac academic. But actually, I don't want to move that score. I don't actually agree um, that I have to share my personal characteristics or my, or my personal life with the world. Um, there are people who want to. Martin Weller himself does it. Um, but I, I don't want to do that. Uh, so contribution of OERs is it's growing a little bit. It's not as good, good as it could be. And that is, that is also to do with this rather introverted personality of mine and, and feeling that uh, should I really be pushing my stuff out there. Um, so there's, it's quite a complicated thing. And I, I really would recommend that you have a go at this. Um, and just, it's very straightforward to do. Just put it all in a spreadsheet and generate the radar graph and then just you know, fill it in if you want to and, and have a look at what your pattern is, because it tells you quite a lot. Uh, I think I probably should contribute more OERs, or try to at least. Um, I could be more adventurous with new technologies, but I'm, actually I'm fairly happy with the ones I've got. Um, and I'm, I'm reasonably happy with, with, with that, but there is room for improvement. So um, I thought I would just share that with you. But here are, here are some examples of people who really go for it and uh, are much more 
much more open and lots of different ways of being open. So Gronje Canal, I'm sure you, many of you will have heard of Gronje. She actually wrote the book that she's just published, Designing for Learning in an Open World. Um, she wrote it online. Uh, chapter by chapter, seeking feedback, feedback before she actually published it. That was a very open process. I don't think you can get much more open than that. So that was one example of um, open practice there. Uh, a lesser example is people who share their bookmarks, um, social bookmarking Digo Delicious, which is great uh, for other people. Um, PhD students are increasingly opening up uh, in the research they're doing. Uh, so I've got two examples here, one on the left hand bottom corner and one on the right hand bottom corner. The one on the right um, finished her PhD some time ago, um, Mathemogenic and uh, Lilia Efimova, I think her name, yes, Lilia Efimova. Um, she was actually doing her PhD into blogging, and so she blogged the whole process and was fascinating to watch. And then Lee Blackhall has openly talked about whether he wants to do a PhD, how he wants to do it, do it in the open. So there's another one, and there are more. Plenty, plenty more, and PhD students use Twitter a lot in the PhD chat um, stream uh, and share a lot and are opening up really a lot. Um, there's a whole directory of open access journals that you can look for if you're hoping to publish, um, and there are and and research is beginning to open up now. And that's interesting, particularly in science. There's a, there's a move to publish your data as you go along, which you can imagine is, is quite tricky um, to do. And so you can have a look at that. And there's an open research movement. And I think it was in New Zealand earlier this year, there was an open research conference as well. Uh, and then the footprints of emergence is, is our own, uh, with my colleagues Roy um, Williams and Simone Gumpta, is our own open research wiki where we are developing our research in, in the open um, on that wiki and people are willing to, uh, people are happy, we are willing and happy for people to, to share um, and put up their own ideas and communicate with us in that way. So there are many, many different ways in which you can be um, an, uh, you know, an open academic. And there are many uh, ways in which you, uh, venues and media that you can choose for doing this. The one that I haven't mentioned, I've realized, is Alan Levine's um, uh, blog, in which he has published um, true stories of openness and amazing stories of openness, uh, which are really interesting to read. And so, for example, in his own instance, he tells of a, he's a very keen photographer of flowers, and he took a photo of a flower. He didn't know what it was. He published it on Flickr, and he got the answer from the other side of the world. So that was one story. Stephen Downs, um, who is also a very open um, academic, has has published a story there about how he actually got a job in Australia by openly publishing his work. Um, so there are, there's lots of evidence to show the advantages of open academic practice. So now that we've done that, um, can we have a go at this activity? Um, there are Here I've got a grid, and I would like you, if you're willing, to put yourself on this grid according to how open you think you are on the horizontal axis there. Are you tending to be the closed, more lone academic, or are you more at the open digital end? Um, do you use extensive, have you extensive use of technologies or limited use of technologies? And so, yes, somebody's already done it, but for those of you who haven't, you can put your name, you can put a cross, a star, play about with the um, whiteboard tools and, and put yourself somewhere on this grid. And we'll see. George has put himself as a closed <laughs> academic. 
Is that true, George? <laughs> right. <laughs> No. I wasn't going to notice that. <laughs> no, I, I, I was. I moved. I, I placed myself on the uh, vertical axis before placing myself on the horizontal axis. So I think, hopefully, I've shiveled over there to the right somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you have. You're over there on the yeah, over on there the right, on the right somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> Liz, publishing hat. Liz OCSLD hat. <laughs> I think that's um, that's interesting, Liz, because not all aspects of us will be open. There will be aspects of us that are closed, even with our within our academic practice. It won't be everything that we're open about. So I think that's very interesting. Thanks for that. Emma's put herself fairly bang in the middle, or are you moving yourself? Emma, oh, you've moved yourself right up there. Great. Hi, yes, thank you. I just noticed, oh, right, uh, Liz Lovegrove just picked it up in the chat as well, that uh, Liz, Lisa Lisantu um, has not had um, been able to write on the whiteboard, and I was just going to say, can I help? But it seems like Liz has helped by saying, check out the toolbar to the left of the whiteboard screen. Uh, I hope that's um, Lindsay's on it. Thank you, everybody. Hey, keep trying. Yes. OK. Oh, somebody's moved themselves. <laughs> Okay, so it looks from here like um, most people are making extensive use of technologies or are up there somewhere. Um, and we're sort of fairly evenly distributed along the closed uh, loan academic to the open digital academic. I'm just wondering if at this point, uh, Marion and Liz, you said, um, we'll take a pause here, you said that you you might be able to raise You've been looking at the chat, and some people might have questions, or are we good to carry on? I guess to read the comments out, would that be helpful? Yes, yeah, that would be lovely. Right. Thanks. Let's have a look. Okay, so there's a. I think John, with our OER sharing, I find myself doing that widely with folks. Who live and teach in my postcode, but not sharing so much beyond that locally open academic, which is interesting. So I wonder if that means um, being open within your university, but maybe not be on the bounds of the university. It sounds maybe, to me a bit more like um, working in working in a community as opposed to working um, in a network. Mm -hmm. And then Jane, yeah. Jane Martin, yes, we have blocks on certain forums. Uh, Sylvia says it's tricky to keep it personal and professional separate. It's tricky to keep the personal and the professional separate at times. Yes. Um, what do you think about that, Jenny? Yes, I, I, well, I have to agree, and I think my own um, characteristics showed that. You know, that um, I myself am probably more cautious than some people out there who um, are less cautious. I, it's very much a personal thing uh, that people have to make decisions about. Um, somebody called Dave is so, saying, I think okay. Dave Aldridge, there is still great scepticism in my field about work published in newer OA journals. The feeling, perception, is that the, the quality to get published is better by, um, by more traditional sources. So I think that's really interesting. Mm, yeah, I think I think that perception is very wide. Um, I think it is breaking down. 
Um, and there is evidence to show that if you publish in open journals, you get cited very much more frequently than if you publish in a closed journal. Um, I'm not quite sure where the evidence for that is now. I couldn't put my finger on it right now, but if you really wanted it, I could, you could find it. George. George. Um, yes, I had an exchange with Anne-Marie Cunningham at the University of Cardiff Medical School about this. And uh, what, what it is is that people who publish extensively in the um, blogosphere, whatever you want to call it, the, you know, that, um, who self-archive and blog their work, get cited more highly also in the refereed journal. So it's not that their um, blog stuff gets cited, it's that they publish in both uh, forums and they're publishing in the social media forums appears to be correlated. There's a correlation, if not causal, um, with the um, citation indices in the more traditional forms. So you still have to do both, <laughs> but the yeah. one helps the other. They may indeed be mutually constitutive. I mean, uh, Martin Weller and um, yourself indeed, Jenny. You know. <laughs> <laughs> do you have time okay. for another comment, Jenny? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, I admire those who can balance the personal and professional. Lou McGill is a great example, and that's from Chris Chrisman. Yes, I agree, Chris. And, and thanks for posting the link to Lou's um, blog. It's a really fascinating blog and, and well worth um, having a look at. I subscribe to it. Um, so, okay, I'm going to uh, move on now if uh, everybody's happy. Thanks for, for this. This, is, this will be nice to keep this um, slide and very interesting to have a, have a good look at and think about. Okay, so I just wanted to say here that all this hasn't just come out of thin, thin air. Yes, we've had advancing technologies uh, which have sort of pushed us to be more open and certainly in facilitate um, us being open. Um, but theory is also moving in, in that direction um, a bit. Uh, there has been quite a lot of talk on theory. Well, there's always been a lot of talk on theory, but a couple of things have um, caught my attention recently. And one is that on the ELISIG, in the ELISIG community, which is a special interest group for people who are interested in how learners experience online learning, um, I think it was last week, Steve Wheeler, or it might have been the week before, Steve Wheeler did a sort of whistle-stop tour through the theories that he thought influence online teaching and learning. So um, you might like to have a look at those at some stage. Um, I'll see if I can find a link to the LSIC, or maybe somebody could put a link to the LSIC, because I know there's a recording of, of um, his talk um, on there. Um, so. So he has has done uh, an interesting talk there, and in the Octel MOOC, I don't know if anybody was is um, following the Octel MOOC, which is the uh, alt uh, MOOC that's carrying on, on into uh, technology enhanced learning that's happening at the moment. Uh, Liz Masterman. Um, did a talk uh, and included a slide on theories which um, inform technology enhanced learning. So there's a lot of theories around, but these are the three here that have influenced my practice um, as an open academic. And so I'll just say a little bit about, about these three here. Social learning theory comes from the work of um, Etienne Wenger. And he's had a tremendous influence on, on my work um, for quite a number of years now I've been following his work. Um, he believes uh, that all learning is social and, and I, I go along with that. Um, but even if we're working as that lone academic, um, it, there is still a social 
connection and that when we work in community practice we um, are sharing through a mutual engagement a joint enterprise and we develop a, a shared repertoire so implicit in that at least within that bounded community is an openness because none of that would work if we didn't share um, so, although he doesn't talk about openness necessarily, he does talk about uh, sharing, but not necessarily in those words. He talks about negotiating meaning through social connection with others. Um, and that seems to me to have very strong links with being an open academic. Uh, all of us um, are in some way involved in some communities of practice through our work um, and so in some sense we will be open within those communities and then there was the work of um, Stephen Downs and George Siemens George Siemens proposed this connectivism as a theory originally there are still people who think this is not a theory some people, Francis Bell, for example, wrote that it was a phenomenon, not a not a theory. Um, but it's gaining, it's, it is gaining ground, and they are much more interested in networked um, uh, learning and networks, and in the connections we make in our networks. So their view is that the knowledge is actually in the network. And in order to gain access to that knowledge, we need to make connections to others and learn how to um, navigate the network and find the information. Their view is that there's far too much information out there at the moment. We can't possibly hope to manage it um, all by ourselves. And we need to be networked to find it and to get help in how, knowing how to manage it. That's a very simplistic explanation of, of their work. But again, um, their view is that open sharing is First of all, you are autonomous to do that. You make your own choices about where you go, who you connect with, what information you access, um, and then you share. Uh, but openness is essential for that uh, to work. And that, those are the principles on which this MOOC is based as well. Openness, autonomy, interaction um, with each other. So. Uh, and diversity, the fact that we're a diverse group and the more networked you are, the more, the more diverse the group is going to be. So that that's, has also had a tremendous influence on me since I did my first MOOC in 2008. And since then, um, I've been working with Roy Williams and Simone Gumptow on what open learning environments mean. And I was struck particularly from that very first MOOC about how chaotic it was um, and how difficult it was to navigate and, and how uncertain everything seemed and how there seemed to be no predictable outcomes. And so that became the focus of research ever since then, um, which is becoming more refined in recent uh, papers. Um, and we're, Roy Williams and Simone and I are, are really interested in emergent learning. In other words, that in these open environments, it's not possible to predict what's going to happen. Learning is going to emerge. We don't know where it's going to emerge or how it's going to emerge, and the environment is very uncertain. The other person who's written about this is um, Dave Cormier, and um, he has uh, written quite a lot about uncertainty, and his, he has proposed that we should think about um, learning in networks as rhizomatic, and I'm not going to go into that now, but it, it has, um, it's worth following up uh, in relation to the uncertainty of learning in these open environments. So those are the three theories that have really influenced um, my work, and you might like to have a look into them um, at, at uh, some stage, and also the many others. Uh, that are around. So now that we've talked about characteristics of, of um, being an open academic, um, examples of how people are actually doing it, um, the theories that might influence it, 
Um, thanks, Lindsay, for posting that link. I'm getting lost now. I do have these links, but I haven't managed to keep keep up with where I am. Uh, so thanks, many thanks for that. Um, I thought we'd uh, have a poll, uh, do a couple of polling activities. You may be thinking at this stage, uh, this is not for me. I don't. I don't want to do this. And here are some typical reasons for why you might not want to do it. Um, it is time consuming. Um, I was recently, and Sylvia was there too, talking to Nancy White. And I don't know if, if you've all heard of Nancy White. She is a very open practitioner and is um, very highly respected for her work uh, on the web. And we were talking to her about her practice. And I was very struck by the fact that she gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning and spends from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock just checking on her network and what's going on in, in blogs and in, in all the people she knows. So I thought, you have to be really committed to this open business <laughs> because it is time consuming. So that's the first thing. Risk to reputation. I don't know if how many of you or if any of you um, saw the viral video of, of the student standing up and haranguing uh, the teacher that's gone out, Jeff Bliss. Anybody see that? Um, that's gone out. That is a risk to to uh, reputation that your students are going, if you're open, are going to get at you. Um, or other people, or your peers even. So that's a risk. Risk of plagiarism, particularly with regard to research. Um, my colleagues and I have had long discussions about this, just how much data do you put up? When do you put it up? How do you, when do you open it? Uh, what are the risks? So um, will you be plagiarized? Will you have your ideas stolen? And the other one, of course, is loss of privacy. Are people going to invade your privacy? Will you be left alone? Will people want to know all about you? And so on. So here are four reasons. Of those four, um, we're going to poll now. So we need the, oh, it's been changed. How fantastic. If you see the little A under, under the um, moderator's box, um, that's the poll. And if you click on the drop-down box, you'll get uh, a, B, C, or D. Which one of those A, B, C, or D for the polling is closest to you of the reasons why you wouldn't want to be open? And if you've got any others, um, please feel free to write them on this screen. Have, is that clear? <laughs> um, for this poll, OK. You need to be, my name just as it is at the top. Uh, do you see that? Um, and then there's a smiley face and where you can put up your hand. And then on the right, there's an A. And you click on that, and you can get the poll. But now we need to publish the poll. So is anybody managing to do that? Let me just have a look. Yes, some people are. So um, let's see if we can publish the poll. Ah, fantastic! Thank you. Keep going because we can. It'll just keep scoring in um, there. Professional accountability. Thank you for whoever wrote that. Oh, the polls. The polling result has gone. We've got a hand up. Um, would you like to take the mic? Whoever, Chris. Oh, oh, hands are up. Rather than, uh, is that for a question or is it? Please take the mic if, if, if you've got a question. Uh, Lighton, Litton, did you have a question? Yes, Lindsay, that is an interesting result. <laughs> Time consuming. I, um, I think it is. I'm not sure if the uh, people who haven't, haven't voted it, uh, is if it's because um, you you know you can't access the poll, oh, I, but I hope I hope you can. Okay, so that gives you an indication, and we've got one or two more ideas here. Perceived lack of prestige at the beginning of an academic career. I couldn't agree more. I think the risks are highest 
for those at the beginning. Martin Weller himself says it's easier to be open when you've already got an established reputation. And I, I, I think that's true. Um, when you're just starting out, uh, there's a lot of risk there. Um, and you just have to try and, try and get over it if you're interested in being, being open. Fear of criticism, absolutely. Um, all these things. Great. Um, I'm just looking at the time, so I'm going to um, move on now. Uh, thank you for that. And possible reasons for openness. Now, when I looked around at what people like Martin Well have been saying, these are four of the reasons that seem to come out over and over again. So we need a new poll. Or is, have we started a new poll? Can somebody talk to me? <laughs> I, hiya, Jenny. Um, everybody's, I'm sure everybody's yeah. <laughs> quickly looking at polling, um, <laughs> polling type. It's set A to D still. So just go for it. A to yeah. I can't see the um, polling uh, symbol. Ooh. Is everybody managing to find it? I can't so see it now. Indeed it has. It's gone. How interesting is that? Not very. Uh, lock responses? They don't want to go there we go. Ah, oh, there we are. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so we, we're selecting which one of these uh, would would be most significant for you to. All of the it. above. I want all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> no. I refuse to answer. Um, or you can add some more ideas. So that's great to get feedback on emergent ideas. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people uh, use Twitter and their blogs um, and their networks um, for this. That's a great, great one. They're all very similar. Um, yes, yes, I suppose they are in a way. It is difficult to um, distinguish, but I'm trying to think which one which one I would choose myself. For me, it would be my philosophy, and that would be C, to democratize education, because that's the underlying belief under the others. But everybody will have their own reason and their own. I, I'd put it the other way around. I'd put the co-creation of knowledge as something that underpinned democratization. But you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There we are then. Chickens and eggs again, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Yes, absolutely. So this this looks like like it was a bit more difficult to um, decide on. We don't have so many responses here. Yeah. But thank you for right. that. I repeat that. Okay. Okay. To enjoy the diversity <laughs> of opinions. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's move on then. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting to the main point that I've, this is more or less my last point or nearly my last point um, that I want to make and that there's an awful lot of talk out there about being open to the extent that it can sometimes be perceived almost as a tyranny, you know, be, you must be open. Um, one colleague online uh, or, or somebody I've discussed with online, I don't know, but and I greatly respect is Dean Chareski. And I did take him to task on call, uh, calling sharing a moral imperative, because I don't feel that that kind of language, um, calling sharing and openness a moral imperative, um, really gets to the heart of what it's all about. We've seen in the previous slides that there are many ways in which you can be open. And we now have all the tools. And we have the reasons for being, being open. And it all makes sense uh, when you look at it carefully. But the fact is that each of us has to make a decision based on who we are. Because ultimately, as Etienne Wenger says, learning changes who we are. Whatever we do in our learning processes, uh, impacts on our identity. It makes us who we are. So those decisions that we make about openness are going to affect our identity. They are not to be taken lightly. 
Um, and Stephen Down sort of backs that up and says uh, openness should work both ways. Uh, you should be able to opt in and <laughs> opt out. And then Terry Anderson says, um, he tries to be um, <coughs> comforting and says, uh, you know, if you, if you do share thoroughly with your students, because this work is not just with your, your peers and colleagues, it's with your students as well, uh, then those are the most successful e educators. But that doesn't mean that you have to um, give everything away. You're not giving away your expertise. I think he uses the example of lighting a candle, lighting to using your candle to light somebody else's candle. Um, your candle remains lit. You've, you've just helped somebody else light their candle. I think that's really a nice uh, metaphor that he uses there. But Martin Weller caught my attention when he said that openness is a state of mind. So it's more than the actions. It's being open-minded. And my colleague Carmen Chauvin and I wrote a paper about the difficulties um, of the dimension, these dimensions like autonomy, mm -hmm. openness, interaction at a psychological level how difficult they are. And we decided that openness is an internal state rather than external expression. Um, and for me, openness is a way of being. It's part of who you are. And therefore, um, we then have to think in, I think, in these terms. I think uh, George Valetianus, um and his colleague have absolutely nailed it with this comment. Scholars are finding themselves in a position which they can shape and or be shaped by openness. In other words, it's in our, it's in our control. Uh, we can decide how open we want to be. Um, the world is open now. I think that's something we can't ignore. If I go back to that very first slide, there are things that we can't ignore. Uh, when I first started teaching, and this may be the case for some of the rest of you, I used to go into my classroom, shut the door, and I never saw anybody for weeks on end apart from my class. I wasn't observed, I wasn't appraised, I wasn't inspected, nobody came in. And it was one of those Victorian classrooms that had the windows high up, couldn't even see out. It was a very, very closed environment. But now the world is your classroom. Uh, we've seen this a number of times um, through the work that people are doing, like Catherine Cronin was speaking uh, last weekend at, at the ICT conference in Ireland, where she talked about how she uses Twitter to engage her students with people across the world, to have discussions with uh, people across the world. So she was having a a class with uh, Bonnie Stewart, who is also an open practitioner on the other side of the world through Twitter. Um, John Boyer, who I think is from the University of Virginia, or I might be wrong, let me just check that. Um, he invited Aung San Suu Kyi into his lecture via Skype. Uh, imagine that. I mean, that, that's absolutely incredible to do that. So our classrooms can be completely open now, but we can choose. We choose how open we want to be. We can be shaped by openness or we can shape it, or a bit of both. And I think um, that's more or less where I'd like to leave it, apart from say that the focus of this week is on reflection. And I think it would be really great if took this opportunity, or we all took this opportunity, to reflect on how open we are. If we think we're very open, do we have the evidence for it? Where is the evidence? If we don't feel that we're open, then what little step can we take towards openness if we believe that it's important? Uh, so we could open a Twitter account, we could blog, um, we could think about what we're going to do with our students, and so on. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. I've got some references here. And if anybody needs more references, please ask me, because I do have links to everything that I've been talking about today. Um, thank you.
Hello. Uh, can I just ask, invite everybody to thank Jenny um, in the usual manner with a round of applause. There's the uh, little applause. Yes, and I think we have some questions. Ah, I see. This is probably a applause from the raising of hands. Yeah, there's applause from the raising of hands, and there's applause from the drop-down smileys. Um, let me put my hand down, and then um, let's see. Lusantu, do you have or uh, Zoe a question for Jenny, or are you voting and polling and clapping? I think Stephanie says, thank you. Cat weasel. <laughs> Who's the cat weasel in here? All the links on your slides aren't working. It's really, yes, that's true. The slide uh, links, slides that are posted to the whiteboard in um, Collaborate do not preserve their links. Those just go up there as JPEGs. They're not image maps. They're not linkable. Um, Liz. Lovegrove, hello Liz Lovegrove. Um, Jenny, if Liz, if you can get Jenny's slides off of her and um, upload those into the same place that the um, recorded video will go, that would be great. Then the links will be available. Um, uh, Lucentu, uh, Mart, J. Martin, and Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, do you have your hand up? To have your hand up. Yeah, I did. I just, I just posted my uh, posted my question in the box. Um, if you can see it, um, does does it open? Ah, it does open. Yeah, I, I work with uh, quite a few <laughs> design teachers, um, and uh, you know they, they they like the hands-on stuff and they like the face-to-face -face stuff, and something that. They often like to um, debate with me is um, whether open education or open practice has to mean online practice. So that's that's really my question, really. I think it's an interesting one. No, I I would say Great no. <laughs> um, my immediate response would be no, because if openness is being open-minded as opposed to using technical tools then that would be what we would encourage in our face-to-face -face classes, which I think, um, which is what well, this week is all about, critical reflection. Do, we, do you have anything to add to that? Any response? I, uh, I, was, I was going to add, or at least uh, chip in, um, which is that uh, openness to me, yes, it is always a stance. But um, I think the internet has provided a way of once again challenging the urge to enclosure. Um, or in every generation, there is uh, <laughs> there is a chosen one. In every, you know, there is a um, technology. Uh, something happens which causes. Um, enclosures and deportations and human migrations and um, you know, move major shifts of thoughts and ideas. Uh, you know, the printing press is given credit for one of them. And I, I think the internet, you know, you can choose all your various watershed moments. But I think the internet is one. And I think MOOC has kept this sort of transformational potential of the internet sort of up there in the front of everybody's conversations. It's what Bonnie Stewart calls um, the, the MOOCs have been a proxy for the ongoing discussion about openness that has been happening forever. She read about uh, Michel Foucault, um, if Foucault ran a MOOC, um, speculating that um, you know, the, the, the responsibility of the public academic is to run public open courses. That's that's my rant. <laughs> I hope I hope um, most people have had their questions answered. I'm um, I'm sorry if I've, I've probably missed loads of questions. Um, so do take a chance now, or feel free to email me. I'm happy to be emailed about this. Jay Shelton asks, are MOOCs fundamentally panoptic? Marion says, you've been great, Jenny. Yes, absolutely, Jenny. You've been great. 
Are Thank moves you. fundamentally panoptic? Yeah, probably so. Don't yeah. you? Think? <laughs> <laughs> probably. Um, if you're going to if you're going to actually be successful in them, I mean, there are many people who um, uh, lurk in MOOCs, and that's absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you're Marian actually going did, to fully engage. Yeah. Marion did quite a lot of work uh, trying to uncover the um, sort of rationales behind the people who lurked in last year's um, 2000, uh, FSLT 2012 and got managed to manage to winkle some comments out of, out of a few people. Um, it is quite difficult. Um, there's also a, a real tendency to try to go for the um, quantified um, information, you know, that, that somehow if you count it, it's um, more real than if you simply, you know, cherry pick the comments that um, support your position. I'm yeah. not sure and, that and in, in the paper that I wrote with uh, Carmen Chauvin, um, we discussed lurkers in terms of observing mindfully. In other words, if, if, they're, if they're observing with an open mind, that's part of openness. It isn't sharing. I think there's a, there's a confusion, isn't there, between openness and sharing. I mean, one doesn't necessarily imply the other. I'm thinking off the top of my head here now. <laughs> but um, I think we need to think carefully about what we mean by sharing. And actually, there's been a nice discussion between Rudy and uh, David about transparency. Um, in the reflective process, and uh, David made some nice comments um, today about not uh, getting confused about what we mean by transparency. Uh, I don't know if David's here and whether he can say anything. I think they were both here earlier, but I'm not sure. David definitely was here. Yeah, David's here. Um, David one. Dave Batram, that's who you're talking about, Dave isn't it? Batram. Yes, that's right. I'm just uh, looking to see if I can. Sorry, find Dave, we're picking on you. <laughs> I come hence. Um, <laughs> yes, they, they, they talked about <laughs> transparency and privacy, um, yeah. which very much picked up on on what what we wrote about in that paper. Um, what our point in the paper was, we were trying to make was that. We didn't want. We didn't put it like this, but we we thought that it was a lot more complicated than uh, openness is a lot more complicated than just uh, getting on your blog or getting on Twitter or or what have you. You know that there's a whole psychological dimension to it uh, that we need to consider carefully, and we particularly need to consider that when we're talking about other people's openness, which is why um, I sort of got engaged with Dean Cheresky about the moral imperative of openness, which I, didn't, I don't feel is a helpful approach. And we actually had a very good conversation about it, which was useful. I noticed that X has joined the session. Hello, X. My little, my little boy would be delighted at X, X, being, X marking the spot. X, where, X is where the treasure is always buried. You see here on the map. <laughs> Jenny, um, thank you very much. Marion and um, Liz Lovegrove, uh, Sylvia, I noticed you in here. Everybody that um, made it possible for this, everything that made it possible for me to arrive late to this session. Thank you very much. Um, I had a very entertaining morning um, talking about MOOCs at the University of Hertfordshire, um, sort of trying to do a instant one-off of one of these. I should have just told them to join in here. Um, I did tell them to join in here. So thank you all for coming. Um, Marion, uh, do you want to, as you must have started it, would you like to wrap this up, Marion and or Liz? So thanks again, everybody. Uh, just to thank Jenny for a fabulous session. That was really, really good. Really, really here, enjoyable. Here. Just, just what you need at 4 o'clock, actually. Just what you need. Something that you can really, um, I mean, just some fabulous resources and links, I think. Thank you very much. Really good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you to all the participants who are here so diligently early. Thank you very much. <laughs> We are starting so on time. It's amazing. Um, Liz, shall we stop the recording now?